If you're in a relationship and you have totally lost your motivation, or if you are with someone who has totally lost their motivation to change, to do anything different, and maybe they even think it's all your problem, what what can you do to get past that? Or if you're helping people, if you're a therapist who's helping people in that situation, how do you get unstuck? That's what we're going to cover in today's episode. First, I just want to remind you, as always, that Relationship Alive is an offering for you so that you can have the best relationships possible. If you are finding the show to be helpful, please consider a donation to help ensure that we can continue. Every little bit counts, and you can literally choose whatever feels right for you. So to make a contribution, just visit neilsatin.com slash support or text the word support to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. This week, I want to thank Mary Beth, Julie, Maribeth, Kent, Laura, Sarah, Dave, Michael, Sabrina, Ruthanna, and Holly. Thank you all so much for your generous support and in many cases ongoing support of Relationship Alive. Now when you're in a situation like this where you're feeling stuck or your partner is feeling stuck and you need to take things to the next level, as you might imagine, it is helpful to be able to communicate skillfully and to tackle these challenging topics without it pushing you further apart. So to do that, there are two things that I have available for you. One of them is free, and that is my top three relationship communication secrets. Uh, These are three things that you can put into practice that will radically change the way that you communicate, the way you think about communicating with your partner. To download the free guide, just visit neilsatin.com slash relate or text the word relate to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. And the second thing that I have to offer is my Secrets of Relationship Communication course. This is a full three and a half hour long course that's split up into very quick five to 10 minute long segments that are all about the ways that you can improve the communication in your relationship without your partner necessarily having to do anything. These are all the leverage points that apply to you um, so that you can positively impact the way that you communicate, the level of understanding, the level of connection, and the level of intimacy in your relationship. And you'll also learn what not to do, uh, the common pitfalls in communication skills that people teach, but that actually are counterproductive to effective connecting communication in a relationship. Uh, The course is still in beta at the moment, um, but we are working on a final version. It is available to you if you visit neilsatin.com slash course, C-O-U-R-S-E. And finally, just a reminder that we do have a free Facebook group, the Relationship Alive Community, that you can join to be a part of our safe space to talk about things that are up for you uh, in the world of relationship and to connect with other Relationship Alive listeners. All right, that's it. Let us get on with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. You know how sometimes it feels like you're the only one who's doing the work in your relationship? And we talk about that a lot on this show, this idea that a lot of times it only takes one to make a difference. And there are all these ways that you can make changes that create leverage in your relationship and can totally shift the dynamic. You're in a dance, you change your steps, your partner is going to change your steps. Well, sometimes that's true. And sometimes you are with someone who is really stuck or unmotivated. They they don't want to follow through with things. They really don't think they need to do anything else because they've already done enough. Um, and they're, and in, in fact, they may even be gaslighting you or, or blaming you, like trying to make it seem like everything that's going on, all the problems that you're experiencing are actually your fault. So um, 
I thought it would be good to tackle this topic head on. And to do so, uh, I have a, a very special returning guest today, Dr. Peter Pearson, who, uh, along with his wife, Ellen Bader, uh, have created the Couples Institute. They are leading authorities on not only how to help couples through serious problems like uh, infidelity, other betrayals, um, trust issues, um, but also they train couples therapists. So if you are a therapist, um, you'll definitely want to be paying attention because today we're going to talk both about how you would approach this as the partner and uh, also as a therapist, how you would approach it. So, um, and by the way, this topic, I had a few ideas that I ran by Pete, and this was one that he suggested. And we're going to tackle it in a slightly different way than usual, where I'm actually going to be role playing the part of the unmotivated stuck partner which we were doing a little practice a few moments ago and it's actually challenging for me so i'm i'm gonna have to like muster up my best improv energy to to be that partner um in any case we will have a detailed transcript of today's episode which you can get if you visit uh, neilsatin.com slash ooh, what's this one gonna be neilsatin.com slash unmotivated that's what we're going to call it. So if you go to neilsatin.com slash unmotivated, you can get the transcript of this episode. Um, and uh, we'll talk about this a little bit um, later on, but there is a series of workshops that um, Ellen is going to be giving for therapists that are all about how to use confrontation in therapy um, with your clients, how to confront people um, in general, and then specifically around issues like narcissism and infidelity. Um, and if you if you're interested in that, you can visit neilsatin.com slash institute, as in the Couples Institute, um, to sign up. And that's free, by the way. Um, I think that's enough from me. Let's dive right in. Pete Pearson, so great to have you here with us again on Relationship Alive. Hey, Neil, it's really good to be back. And I am looking forward to doing something kind of unusual. Yeah, uh, me too. <laughs> You get to play the role of a passive or passive aggressive spouse who believes they've done all they need to do and they're done doing more, which is not an uncommon place for therapists to deal with. So I thought instead of just me describing how I might uh, respond to an unmotivated partner, that we would actually put it to the test. Great. <laughs> <And> <laughs> And hopefully it will feel more realistic as you do your best job of mustering an unmotivated, <laughs> passive-aggressive person, which goes against everything you teach and preach. I know. I know. It's, that's why it's so challenging for me. I was like, uh, it, it felt like pulling, you know, I had to really drag it out of me. But let's just say that I may have experienced partners like this in the past. And um, so I'm drawing upon some past knowledge from my own life and then of course um, as a coach I've seen this with people that I'm that I've worked with as well so oh yeah so let's take it from the place where we will imagine I have been working with you and Jill um, for several weeks but we don't seem to be getting anywhere okay so I have now thought about it a lot and taken a new approach so we're going to pick it up where you have come in for another session down the road and i will start by saying the following are you ready yeah just out of curiosity though is jill here with us or is this just yes, with me? jill is here with you okay but i will be speaking mostly to you jack in this process and i will also be talking more than most therapists are comfortable talking to their couple. So I'm going to be saying a lot and I am going to be leading instead of reacting uh, to the situation. I'm really taking a, mu a much stronger leadership position in the direction where we are going instead of just reacting to the problem or the fight or complaint du jour. Got it. And one quick question. What, what is your, um, what process do you go through as a therapist to decide that this is the time to do this? Oh, just generally when I when I think I everything I've tried isn't going anywhere and I can't imagine 
keep continuing doing more of the same, so I then will shift gears. Got it. Um, and do this uh, approach. Got it's it. pretty counterintuitive for most therapists. Okay. All right. All right. Are you ready? I'm ready and super curious as well. All right. So, Jack and Jill, I've been thinking a lot about what we've covered so far, and especially, Jack, about your complaints that you're doing a lot. You feel like whatever you do is not good enough. You keep getting hammered to do more. You get fed up. Uh, it's, it's put a dampener on your sexual connection, your sexual interest, and you try to do things, but it just seems like whatever you do isn't quite enough. And so I've been thinking a lot about the stress between the two of you. You know, Jill saying she can't depend on you, that you're disengaged, you're distant. And so I've been thinking a lot about both you guys since our last meeting. And you might be thinking, you know, Pete, maybe you need to get a life instead of thinking <laughs> about us between sessions. But I was thinking about you guys, and I've actually had – a lot of thoughts about where, where we have been and where we're going in here. Okay. So let me just start, Jack, by, by let's review, let's start uh, by reviewing again, Jack, what, what's your theory about why the three of us are meeting? Well, I mean, things aren't, aren't great in our relationship, but I'd probably be okay with things the way they are and just kind of figure it's it'll this is just what marriage is you know it's it's not always going to be great um so what's your theory about why we're meeting so we're here because Jill wants to be here more than anything and and I think that you know Jill wants me to change in some ways that I mean I'm trying but I'm just you know I'm kind of waiting for her to 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 do her part and um so i don't know i think maybe we're here because eventually things will shift a little bit maybe maybe she'll realize that she's being too hard on me or maybe um, okay so so jack yeah i'm gonna ask you a tough question and you can say answer anything you want except i don't know or pete you're the expert so the question is Given how you just described your theory about why the three of us are meeting, how do I fit in? Uh, what's my role for you, Jack? How do I fit into this process for you? For me. For you. Yeah. Um... And you can say anything except, I don't know, or I'm the expert. Well, there are a couple things that come up for me. And I'm just, you know, we've met for a few sessions, so I'm just going to be candid with you. Pete. Right. Um, sometimes I feel like your role is to just be an asshole to me, um, like to to make this about me when I don't think it's about me, and mm -hmm. um, that that doesn't feel very comfortable. In a so more, you imagine I think that's my role for myself. I feel like you're like part of why you're here is to judge me. Oh, and you think that's my role for me. Yeah, What's I mean, my role for you. Think about my role for you, Jack. What do you think it might be? Well, I think I would like you to to be the objective person who can actually help Jill and me get to the other side of this thing and and sort of help us see what we're not seeing. Maybe help her see what she's not seeing. Um, okay. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you what I've thought about, some of which fits into what you're describing and some doesn't. Okay. Um, and I'm going to say a lot. And when I'm done, you can decide whether or not you choose to come back or not. So I'm going to present a lot of stuff. So you got to pay attention so you can decide whether or not you choose to return. Uh, here's the first thing I'm going to say to you, Jack, and it's going to, Jill is going to go, oh my gosh, I can't believe Pete is saying that. What am I doing here? What am I doing here if he says to Jack what you're about to hear, which is this. So Jack, if you choose to come back, I'm not going to ask you to change. Nor am I 
I'm not going to ask you to set any goals for being in here either. Here's why. And that's heresy from the way I was trained and taught to work with couples. Because if you don't have a goal to change, and if you don't have any goals at all, then you're just, you. it's like going somewhere without a map or a destination. You just wander around. If I'm not going to ask you to change, or I'm not going to ask you to set any goals. What do you think of that as the first step in here, Jack? Well, part of me likes it. Part of me wonders why we would keep coming back at all yeah, if yeah, that were right. the case. What's the, what's the hook? What's the catch? Exactly. If I'm not going to ask you to change. Right. Well, here's why I'm not going to ask you to change. Almost nobody wants to be changed or is told to change. As soon as someone hears, you need to change this and you need to change that, guess how most people start to, to feel or respond? Defensively. Defense, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. As soon as they hear, you need to change. I think only the only people who really want to be changed are babies with a load in their diapers. Other than that, I don't think anybody wants to be changed. It has a moral judgment to it. And besides, um, who's going to decide if change, if you've made enough change or not? You, Jill, me. So change has a way of triggering defensiveness. So I'm not going to ask you to change. I'm also not going to ask you to set a goal. And the reason I'm not going to ask you to set a goal is because goals tend to be quite limiting, actually. If we focus on a goal, then we don't turn our energy to other opportunities. We don't look to create or seize other opportunities. We just focus on the goal. That's it. And when we focus on a goal, our partner generally doesn't give any credit until the goal is achieved. So there's no praising progress. Well, I'm, I'm going to wait till you do it. Then I'll tell you a good job. Uh, goals also, so when people set goals for couples, when they come in and set goals, there's rarely a praising progress along the way. They just wait till it's accomplished. And when somebody achieves a goal, they generally go, oh, check that off, done that, now I can coast. Anything beyond that goal feels like it's a sacrifice and too much work and too much effort. So they coast. And then they start coasting and often they go backwards. Uh, so I'm not going to ask you to set goals either uh, because who's going to judge finally if you're there or not? Who gets to be that judge? You, me, Jill? That's not clear. So I'm not asking you to set goals in here either. What do you think so far? Yeah, I mean, I, I've noticed that when, like that whole thing about accomplishing a goal and I think what's challenging for me is that like, for one thing, when when we set a goal and then we get there, it's it feels like I never really get credit anyway. It's like I just did it because it was a it was a task that we like that we set up for ourselves to do. So it's it's always gonna fall a little short of what Jill's wanted. And that's exactly what happens too often in too many marriages. Why I take this counterintuitive approach about let's don't set goals. Let's don't look for change. So what do we focus on instead? Okay, well, now, wait a second, Pete. Like, what about, because Jill's always talking to me about how we need to have a vision for how we want our relationship well, that's to different. be. That is very different. And I'm, I'm going to get there. So I'm glad you brought that up. Okay. That is really, really different and a key variable. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. Damn, I thought but you were going to tell me that I that she could, had to stop harping on me for that vision thing, but it doesn't sound uh, like it. Wait, listen, <laughs> wait till you hear how it gets placed in your marriage if you want to come back and work in that direction. So if we don't have uh, a desire for change or a desire for setting goals, what do we do instead? Here's what I like to look at instead, which is how do you want to improve or what area would you like to get better in? If you think about improvement, then you already get it. You're getting credit for what you're doing, but we're just trying to make it a little better. So 
uh, change implies that you haven't done anything much worthwhile. But improvement, I want to give you credit for a lot of stuff that you and Jill are doing together, and it's working okay. And we're going to work at improving or getting better in certain areas. Now, here's the interesting thing. Um, people also in the process of improving, it's okay to praise progress. Not only okay, but it's important to say to your partner, oh, I noticed this. So Jill will say, you know what, Jack, I'm really glad. It, and it sounds so simple, Jack. It just sounds so simple. But when you took the garbage out the other night without me asking, I thought, oh, he's actually thinking about me. Now I don't have to worry, should I nag him to remind him? He took it out, it takes a load of stress off me. And Jill would say, Jack, I really appreciate that you emptied the garbage before it was overflowing. Thanks for thinking about us and making our environment a little neater. That's praising progress. It's looking for things that the other person is doing and praising it. We don't do that unless we have, it, it, it's easier to do if we focus on improving or getting better. It makes it easier to notice and comment on it. And that is reinforcing because we know we're doing something the other person cares about. And we know they care about it because they tell us. Cool. So here's the thing. What I've noticed is that couples will seek improvement and put energy and effort into getting better for only two major reasons. That's it. There are only okay. two big reasons that couples will put forth that effort. Reason number one is desperation. Reason number two is inspiration. Desperation means a crisis. Uh, a crisis that uh, there is impending danger that needs to be attended to right now. Like in, in California, the West Coast, the fires are coming. And in one minute, you can say our house is safe. Five minutes later, the wind changes, sparks fly, and you say to your partner, our house looks like it's going to catch on fire. Let's get out of here. And in five minutes, the couple is communicating, negotiating, prioritizing, collaborating, making decisions, and depending on each other. Because the, the crisis, the desperation pulled out of them skills that were already there. They just move those skills to the forefront and they put aside their resentments, their anger, their fears, um, their self-doubts and said, we have to work together as a team. A crisis can be like a fire, it can be a tornado, a hurricane, a serious sudden illness or injury to a member of the family where we have to collaborate and cooperate and negotiate right now. And couples do it. They've had the skills. It just brings it out of them. Uh, a lot of movies actually play on this theme where uh, their earth is being invaded from outer space. So countries put aside their differences and they start collaborating about how they're going to deal with this, this external threat. So that's one desperation. Couples will change. Inspiration is the second one. And I like the, the definition of inspiration. Uh, I think it's from a Latin term meaning to breathe life into or to put energy in something to create something different and new. Uh, the thing about inspiration is that what right now you don't, you and Jill do not have a compelling picture to pull you forward, to work together as a team. So what happens is you turn your negative energy on each other and hope the other one will do more so you each feel more fulfilled, more relaxed, more connected. There's no external inspirational pull that can get you guys to put aside to a, to a large degree your resentments and your fears and start working together toward an inspiring objective vision, something that will make you glad to see each other at the end of the day. Um, it's because when you have, when you're driven by inspiration and a compelling future it's enough to apply what you're learning in here uh when the why when the inspiration is really weak the what to do the how to do it uh is laborious and it feels risky and it just feels like too damn much work for no payoff but when you have uh, an inspiring compelling picture that you guys will create if you come back we're going to work 
at helping you create an inspiring picture of the future, something that excites both of you. And it's a lot more than solving problems. Solving problems is mostly a reactive process by looking backwards. We had this problem, how do we solve it? Solving problems is not creative, it's not generative. I want us to find time and I'll give you exercises that will help you guys create a more inspiring future, something that will pull you together, uh, working together as a team. And I like the acronym for team, which is together each accomplishes more. Uh, and when you're working as a team for an inspiring future, you start to bring out the best in each other. Uh, instead of hammering each other, trying to beat the other person into submission to give you what you want. We're badgering the other person into submission. Um, so the inspiration is the why. We're going to develop a big why. You guys should put forth the effort to make the changes so you can realize the promise of why you guys got together in the first place. Um, I have some more things to say about when couples are working toward an inspiring future, like it's the difference between being right and getting it right. But do you have a reaction so far or questions about what I'm saying so far, Jack? Well, what you're saying makes sense. I mean, the desperation versus inspiration makes sense. I think my my resistance that I feel coming up, if, if it's okay for me to mention that right now, of course, is that um, you know I I love Jill. Like I sit, it's not a problem to sit here with Jill and to, but this has just gone on for so long and gotten so tedious that. I don't know. It's like coming up with a vision. I just, or something that's inspiring. I just feel so far from that. Well, listen, first of all, I appreciate you being clear with the challenge in front of you. <clears throat> and here's one of the reasons why it's still uh, uh, cloudy about whether or not you can do it or have the energy to do it or the motivation to do it. Because you're looking at the future through the lens of yesterday and today which is guardedness, self-protection, not wanting to be taken advantage of, not wanting to be controlled, not wanting to be bossed. And so it's hard to come up with a picture of a compelling future when you feel the way that you are describing. That makes total sense. That's why we're gonna have to spend some time with me collectively generating a picture that you get excited about as well as Jill. Because right now you're not there. You're still looking at the future through basically a windshield that's got like Vaseline smeared all over the front of it. Uh, and it's not clear yet. So we got to make a clearer picture for you for, so that part of you can be excited about it. Now, here's what happens. When you, have, when you create this inspiring future, you're going to be working together as a team. You guys got into the mess you're in collectively, and you're going to get out of it by working together. When you are inspired by a future, you're going to, each of you will focus on getting it right rather than being right. Too often, couples fight over who's right, who has the best picture of the problem, who has the best picture. And then they will each argue mightily over who's got the best definition of the problem, and they fight to be right over their definition of what the problem is. When you focus on getting it right because you have a compelling future, then all of a sudden your, your communication will start to change. When there's a disagreement, you will become curious instead of furious. You're going to ask what's important to the other person, why that's important, how important is it, how did they develop their interest or the value in that approach and what they want, what happens if they get it, what happens if they don't. All good questions to explore, to get to know each other in a more collaborative, non-defensive way. And you're going to be focusing on getting it right instead of being right. At an extreme, a couple could say, honey, do you smell smoke? 
Oh, yeah, I do. It looks like the house is on fire. Well, it wouldn't be if they're focused on being right. They would say, well, yeah, it's on fire because here's what you did. No, I didn't. Here's what you did. And they argue while the house is burning down. That's an extreme version of having to be right Mm -hmm. instead of getting it right. So you change your focus okay. when you think about getting it right. And, and I can help each of you do that about getting it right more often because you're working towards something you both care about. Hmm. And the final thing, Jack, is that um, it's, it's often been said that couples should work at their marriage. I don't think couples should work very hard at their marriage. Here's why. And it has to do with my definition of work. Work is, it's my own definition. Work is any time I do something when I'd rather be doing something else. That's work. Uh, Yep. So, for example, my wife, she likes a clutter-free house. And she says, we got it. We got to spend time cleaning up today. Now, for her, it's not work. It's effort. Effort is anytime you put energy into something for a desired result. Now, for me, it's work. I'd rather do a lot of things than be picking up the house on a Sunday afternoon. So for me, it's work. For her, it's effort. I want you and Jill to make effort, not work. So that when you're working toward, so that when you're moving toward an inspiring future, it requires effort because you choose to do it. You want to do it because of the benefits, the rewards, the connections, the satisfaction of facing life together, side by side, meeting the challenges of life as they come at you. That's effort because you choose to do it. Ellen likes, she really does. That's for her cleaning the house is, it's an effort, it's not work. For me, it's work. So I want you guys, occasionally you're gonna have to put in work, but I don't want you to do a lot of work because you just don't want to do it. You resent it. You won't follow through. And then nothing happens. And each of you complain your marriage is in the doldrums again. So it's fine that we identify effort because you're creating a more inspiring future together. So if you come back, I'm also going to give you a homework assignment. Uh, And here's what it is. It's an assignment where you guys will become stronger as an individual because it takes two strong individuals to make a stronger team. Otherwise, you're like two drunks trying to hold each other up, walking home at midnight where you got to cross busy roads and streets. I don't want that. Two strong individuals, and here's how it's going to start. Each of you, until we meet again, should you decide to come back, each of you will, every day, you're going to do something you feel proud of. It could be anything. I don't care what it is. You resisted a second cookie. Uh, you took action on something you've been procrastinating about. You avoided making a snarky comment to your partner uh, for the sake of a better relationship and not having to spend time, you know, with cold shoulders toward each other. So every day you're going to do something you feel proud of. And you can do that no matter what your partner does. So it's not dependent on your partner's treatment or action or what they're doing. Every day you will do something you feel proud of. And we're going to talk about that. And so that's that's the first homework assignment you're going to get. Uh, and then we're going to talk about other ones. And I'm going to show you some videos about working as a team and what that really means so that you can feel inspired to move ahead. So that's my long spiel. With the question, finally, are you interested in coming back? And if you say yes, I'll say why. If you say not really, I'll say why as well. Because I'm curious, whatever you say, I'm curious about your thinking behind your choice of what to do. So are you ready to make a decision to come back or not? Um, Because this is the direction we'll be going should you decide to return. Well, um... I'm intrigued, Pete. I'm intrigued by this process. Um, you've, I've gotten a little beat up for not doing my homework for our sessions before, so I'm a little hesitant about, okay, like, sounds like there's going to be more homework to do, and but at the same time, like, do I really not want to do something that I would be proud of? I mean, I think 
I want to be doing things that I'm proud of in general. Um, uh, all right, Pete, I'm just going to be, I'm just going to level with you that like part of the challenge is that I just feel like this whole thing, all these problems and life and, you know, the, we got our kids and, you know, and we, and I'm, so I'm a little bit like, okay, there are some problems here that if we don't deal with them and I, I'm remembering what you said before about problems, but so part of me is like, well, are we going to deal with the problems that are there, especially the ones that I think Jill really should be dealing with? And then I also just am noticing that I don't have a lot of energy. And so I'm, again, I'm feeling like I kind of want to say yes, but at the same time, I really don't have a lot of faith that that I'm going to have the energy to do what you're asking us to do. And you may not, and that's okay too. So here, here's a suggestion, that will you give it a go for X number of meetings, knowing that we, we, will, we will tackle problems because you guys got problems, so we're going to tackle problems. However, at the beginning, when you come back, we're going to be focusing on creating an inspiring future to give you a reason to make the effort, a reason, compelling reason, so that you can feel more excited about doing what you're doing because you're going toward an objective that you care about, that you're interested in, that makes your kids look up to you and say, Dad, I really admire the way you and Mom deal with your differences. I respect and admire how you communicate with each other. You're setting a role model for a good marriage for us. I really appreciate it. Now, to the degree that's a value to you, that's part of a compelling future. Like if, you're, if your kids come to you uh, on their wedding day and they say, what advice would you give to me to have a really good, solid marriage? I would, I'm going to ask you to think about what advice would you give to them and how consistent are you in aligning yourself with that higher value? So it's another way of looking at the future. It's another way of looking at what you want to create and why. Uh, but this is what we're going to focus on. We're not going to come back and start tackling problems until you get a better, bigger reason why you would be moving in that direction. So what I think I hear you saying is that you're just looking for me to commit to a little bit of time to try and come up with this vision, which may work or may not. But if it does, then you, your feeling is that I'll feel motivated and energized by having this. Think um, about anything, vision. anything that you really wanted in your life that was important to you, that you put effort into it because you chose to invest the effort and or the risk of making it happen. That's what I want for this marriage when you come in here. I mean, I guess it would be nice to feel that again. It would be. And after a few weeks, if you decide, nope, I don't want to, that's fine. Then you can say, I gave it a shot and it's not working. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to resign from the process and that's okay. I want to discontinue or take a break or both. So Pete, can we go meta for a moment here? Sure. Okay. So um, in in a recent conversation with David Burns, he was talking about how he often finds that couples, when it comes right down to it, that they're they're often not motivated to fix their problems that they because That's they true. get something from their problems. That's all, well. Go ahead. I mean, that's I'm I'm paraphrasing here. Of course. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And. Um, and so I, I've been kind of entrenched as Jack here um, in this this quandary. Uh, I'm imagining that unease of being like, well, I don't really know. I don't know if I want things to get better. Like I might actually just want this whole thing to fail. Like I might just want to have an excuse and, to finally walk away from this thing. That's a possibility. And I would rather know that sooner than later. 
if I'm working with you guys, I would rather know that sooner than later. And then I will give you going back to the role play again, I would say this. So Jack, let me tell you about the conundrum that every human faces when they have the challenge of, cha of growing or not. And it was elo eloquently and elegantly summed up by James Baldwin, who said, nothing is more desirous than to be relieved of an affliction, meaning I would like to put an end to my pain, my loneliness, my fear, my self-doubts, my insecurities. Nothing is more desirable than to be relieved of, of an affliction, and nothing is more terrifying than to be divested of a crutch, meaning our defenses, our coping mechanism. We want relief and we are terrified when it comes to giving up the self-protection. I am suggesting, Jack, that motivation is the judgment that something is more important than our fears and our resentments and our insecurities and anxieties. Until a person judges there is something more important, we will stay in our self-protective bubble. So coming in here, Jack, is creating a compelling uh, future, inspiring future for you and Jill working together. And hopefully it's strong enough that you make the judgment that inspiring future is stronger than your anxieties and resentments and self-protections. Well, as Jack, Neil, Neil's voice is really loud here, being like, that sounds pretty good, actually. <laughs> I'm wondering what Jack would say. What, Pete, in your experience, what, is, what does Jack typically say in a moment like this? Well, see, it's not typically, but I'll tell you what happens when I put it out as clear and as strong as I do. People will make a decision sign me up, let's see what we can create together. Or what this has exposed in me is I'm really not interested in putting forth more effort into the marriage. And I am really, I like that, I, I seek that clarity. Otherwise they keep coming in and I frustrate and annoy them and frustrate myself trying to create some change when they don't apply what they're learning. I would rather know that sooner, but instead of just saying, well, if you're not motivated, which is not very good, I would say I want to help you offer you a more compelling picture of the future. Then if you say, no, thanks, I have done my job. And I don't feel bad if you choose not to come back because we've stopped the frustration. But you have a clear choice. You can stay in as uh, most people, like James Baldwin says, do not want to be divested of their crutch. You may not be ready at this point to see something more important than your self-protective bubble uh, or your resentments, your fears, your anxieties. And that's okay. I got to respect the choice that everybody makes. Are they ready or not? That's whatever choice they make. So I'm cool with it. So I, I don't think my role is to try to talk you into something else. My role is to help you discover a more compelling future, one that inspires both of you so you have a big enough why to say, in my judgment, that's better than what I am doing now. And I think that's where a lot of therapists kind of fall short. They don't help create a compelling enough future. What they do is they talk about what the person is doing, the consequences of the doing, and would they like to do something better without having a bigger picture for why should I even go down that path? Mm. See, I want, you to, I want you to see a bigger picture. Yeah. Pete, we just need to take a quick break to talk about this week's sponsors. Our first sponsor is a new sponsor here to the show. I've only spoken about them once before. And along with podcasts like this one, of course, there's a whole world out there of entertainment. Sometimes you want to be able to check out something new. And by that, I mean, there's lots of compelling international shows that you may actually be missing out on and not know about. So if you haven't checked it out yet, it's time to burst the domestic TV bubble and check out Acorn TV. 
Acorn TV is a commercial-free streaming service that's rooted in British television. It's home to sophisticated and artful storytelling with top-rated mysteries, dramas that pull you in, heartfelt comedies, and so much more. And unlike other British streaming services, Acorn TV has content from Ireland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and beyond. I've recently been watching this comedy that they have called The Other One, which is super quirky, and it features Siobhan Finneran, who you might know as the scheming maid from Downton Abbey. And just the first episode had me laughing and cringing and crying as they highlight just how awkward, uncomfortable, and unpredictable relationships and life can be. With new content added every Monday, you will never run out. And you can stream it all on your favorite device for just $5.99 a month. So escape to British television and beyond without leaving your seat. Just try Acorn TV free for 30 days by going to acorn.tv and using my promo code, which is ALIVE. That's A C O R N acorn.tv code alive to get your first 30 days for free if you're looking for some extra support around the things that get in the way of your happiness or achieving your goals one great way you can do that is from the comfort of your own home or office or anywhere really uh, using BetterHelp. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist you can chat via text with your counselor at any time, and you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions all without having to go anywhere. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is also available. They also offer a broad range of expertise so that you can find the person most suited to helping you with your own unique situation. In fact, so many people are using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. So whether it's depression, stress, anxiety, things coming up in your relationship, anger, conflict, whatever is up for you, try out BetterHelp to help you move past the places where you may be stuck. To start living a happier life today, you can try BetterHelp and get an extra 10% off your first month as a Relationship Alive listener. Just visit betterhelp.com slash alive. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash alive. And thank you, Acorn TV and BetterHelp for your support of Relationship Alive and the mission of improving relationships worldwide. And now, uh, Pete, let's continue with our conversation. Can we talk a little bit about what that process looks like of creating sure. the bigger picture? Sure. So first of all, <laughs> so first of all, I would say uh, I want to do a deathbed scenario that your kids come to you, Jack, and you're on your deathbed and they're asking for advice. Dad, before you die, what are the mistakes you hope I wouldn't make in my life? What are the things that you regret doing in this marriage? What do you wish you would have done differently? And maybe I can learn from your pain before you go. Maybe I could learn from your experience. What do you wish you would have done differently? So that's one scenario. The other scenario is you guys come back and I would say this. Uh, let's brainstorm for a moment about what do you think would happen? So I'd, I would have them each name some area where they feel really stuck on in the, in the marriage. And then I would say, I would like you to imagine that you've lost your fear and you've lost your resentment on that problem in that area. You've lost your fear, you've lost your resentment. What would your life be like and what would your relationship be like if you lost that fear and resentment? Um, so that's, and then we discuss that. And, and we discuss that whatever they come up with, why is that important? All right, let's talk about one of those. Okay. So, you know, Jill, she used to, she used to go to therapy. I mean, she still does on occasion, but I, f I feel like 
like they must just be talking about the same stuff every single week because honestly I don't see her changing in the ways I would want her to change and um and so I, I think this has been a problem because this is something that I keep kind of like, it's part of why I've drawn my line in the sand has been like, no, I want you to be maybe even see a different therapist or be going more regularly or something. And um, so Jack, I'm going to interrupt and yeah. ask you this question. Great. If you lost your resentment and your fear, what would your life and relationship be like? Well, if I guess if I truly lost my resentment, resentment and my fear, I I wouldn't care what she is doing. Well, how about this? Instead of not caring, you might be more accepting. You might even be more curious about what she's doing. That's what I meant, Pete. That I would be, I'd be more, more accepting. I, I think that's what I meant, but it's definitely not what I meant when I said it. Yeah, because when I said it, I was just thinking, yeah, like, okay. I, I mean, that's part of what's driving me to want her to go is that more the resentment, I guess, than the fear, but some fear too, for sure. For sure. And you would be, and you would actually adopt an inquiring attitude to understand her reasons, her motivations, her insecurities, and her anxieties about why she's doing whatever she's doing. And you would do it with an attitude of acceptance if you lose your resentment and your fear. You would approach it from a very different perspective. Do you think she'd feel differently about you, Jack? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. How do you think she might feel about you if you took that approach? Let's be clear that I don't know if I can do that. Just get rid of my resentment and my fear. We haven't landed on the motivation to do so. Right. And it's okay. Hey, Jack, I just want to say this. I'm not trying to talk you into squat. You don't have to do anything. I'm offering you a possibility that you can accept or say no thanks. Well, I think she would probably fear, she would probably feel, um, she would probably feel more appreciated and accepted and, and, like I like I was curious about yeah about her and she'd probably start treating you a little bit differently too I would imagine what do you think makes sense okay so it it, we're still in the abstract so these are some of the directions we might that we'll talk about in here is creating a more inspiring future with a different attitude got it So that was looking at a specific situation, a specific complaint that I had and asking what would this look like if I didn't have any fear or resentment. Right. And then using that to paint the picture of. Exactly. Now here's here's one more homework. If you guys say, I really am motivated for a while to experiment creating a stronger relationship Mm -hmm. and so here's another assignment i would give you guys every day every day but you're going to do this only because you've bought into the idea that you're going to experiment with creating a better future one of the ways of creating a better future is to work as a team one of the hallmarks of a team is the ability to give each other positive feedback when they're doing something right. Can you imagine coaching a basketball team and never commenting on the progress any team player is making until they get it just right? The only time I'm going to say good job, not only that you've done it right, but you've done it right for a long enough time that I think you've got it nailed. And then I will give you praise. Until then, I will only criticize you Again and again and again. Can you imagine playing for a coach like that? I can. I think I had a high school coach like that. So it was, yeah, it's torture. It, thank you. It's torture. Yeah. When you're putting forth so much effort and you get no recognition. Right. No acknowledgement and you're busting your bunions. And what do you get more criticism? 
that pattern is going to change for the two of you to work as a team. So here's what you're going to experiment with. Okay. Every day, once a day, you're going to you're going to communicate in some way to your partner that you love, value, appreciate, and respect them for something. You could tell them verbally. You could send them a text. You could send them an email. You could buy them a card. You could do something nice for them. Bring them coffee in bed. Wash their car. Put gas in their car. Do something or communicate somehow that you love, value, appreciate, and respect them because that's going to be the foundation for creating a good team where you feel valued as a team player. If you don't feel valued as a team player, screw it. You're out of there. So that's part of creating a strong team. Should you choose to come back and you're going to come back with the desire to make a strong team, this is going to be it. You don't have to do it. You could say, I forgot. I didn't do it. Fine. That's okay. I would just say what you're saying is that the dominant energy in you is not to create a team. And that's okay. So quit, let's quit fooling ourselves. The dominant energy is not to create a, a good team, even though another part of you does, that other part of you is not strong enough. And so you will continue to pay the penalty that you've been paying a struggling, semi-lifeless marriage. And that's okay. I'm not okay, meaning I'm not gonna try to convince you otherwise. You only will make improvements for your reason, Jack, not hers, not mine, only yours. So is it okay to do this appreciation thing even if I'm not really feeling it? You got it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for recognizing that the not feeling like you're ready or want to, that's just the energy that says I shouldn't have to put forth energy into creating a better team, so I'm not going to do it. Right. It's that line between the work and effort. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And right now, if you really if you really don't like giving compliments, I'm going to say, Jill, what's it like living with somebody who doesn't want to give you any kind of credit for what you do, for your contributions, for how you are, who you are? What's it like living with somebody who says, I shouldn't have to give you any credit at all, Jill. Now, I also want you to shape up and start treating me better. So, Jill, what's it like living in that kind of marriage? I can just imagine Jill saying, I'm not sure I want to keep doing this either at this point. It's horrible. It's the, it's, uh, it's torture. That's right. And see, indirectly, I am confronting you, Jack, by talking to Jill like that. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine as Jack how, how hard it would be to hear it laid out in those terms my no kidding my behavior no kidding. yeah no kidding so um is there anything additional because one thing that i haven't really fully done in this as jack is to is to be um fully cynical and i bring this up because um I feel like I'm seeing this more and more in people I know in their, in like in my peer group. So in their forties and fifties where there's kind of a cynicism about relationship that is also yeah. competing with the desire to do any of this stuff. Right. And um, so if you are feeling that kind of like existential, is this really all worth it anyway? Kind of energy coming from Jack. Um, There's only one person can answer that question. You know who that is? That's Jack. Right. And so if Jack were like, well, I really, before I can commit, because what you're saying sounds good, like on paper sounds good, in my heart sound feels good, but I, I think I just need to really decide one way or another if, if I'm willing and say, that's why I say, should you choose to return? Because I'm not going to talk you into it. Mm -hmm. I've tried that too many times. And, I, and too many times I lose that battle. Yeah. Yeah. So this might be a good time to pivot just a little bit and talk about how, because um, you mentioned that, that some of what we're doing could work without a therapist. If, 
Um, so how does how does that move forward? So if because you don't like, I imagine at that point, whatever's motivating this probably isn't going to come from Jack unless it, Jack, if you're listening to this episode, you have a sense of what you could do. But it's probably going to be Jill and the only reason we're in these genders right now is because I'm mostly hetero and because I'm a guy. Like I could have just as easily been Jill being totally. unmotivated and Jack is the one who really wants things I to improve. So the same responses that you gave me from the Jills of the world as well. Right. So um, gender, these kind of these kind of anxieties and resistances are gender neutral. By yeah. the way. Yeah. So just being clear about that. So whether you're Jack or Jill and the the odds are that if you're going to be trying to bring this to your relationship, you're you're whoever is motivated to try and make this thing work. You're probably not right. the one who's just starting to feel stuck and resentful and unmotivated. Right. So so how does this adjust if you're that person? How do you how do you bring it without um, being the nag? You have to you have to approach it. It takes a lot of discussion, first of all. Mm -hmm. And guess what? It would start with a very counterintuitive discussion. Honey, I've been thinking about a lot about our relationship. And I think we were lost or I'm lost in the weeds. We have to make some improvements. And I'm trying to figure out all the rewards, benefits, and its inspirational motives for changing the way I am. Quite frankly, honey, I have been a lousy team player to you. I haven't shown up in a way that's in alignment with my higher values, or as Abe Lincoln would say, my better angels. Too often I've been spending time either disengaging, withdrawing, nagging, blaming, or hassling you. That does not make me a good team player. What I would like for us to do together is to sit down and say, look, if we lost our resentments and we lost our fears about what we've done, what we are doing today, if we lost our resentments and lost our fears, what would our relationship look like? What kind of future would make you excited about being with me? What would I be doing that would make you look forward to seeing me at the end of every day? What would get you excited about pulling together as a team for a better future? Now, sidebar, see, here's what I'm doing. I'm not going to ask you to make any changes yourself. I'm putting it on me. And that makes it easier to have a discussion. Right. Instead of, honey, let's talk about what you need to do. <laughs> right. In order to have a better marriage. So totally get that how do you let's allay the fears and resentments of the person who's having this conversation who's probably thinking i'm always the one who's putting the effort in so i'm gonna go i'm gonna have this conversation with jack or jill or whoever i'm gonna i'm gonna admit my responsibility i'm gonna ask them you know if if we weren't in our fear and resentment what would this look like? How would I be different? I'm going to ask them these things. I don't know if I'll ever get that from them. I don't know if, I'll, if there'll be any reciprocity there. Well, first of all, you don't know unless you try it. So I can't give you reassurance that it will come out okay. And I'm asking for, believe me, I know I'm asking or suggesting an extremely high emotional risk endeavor. I'm asking you to do what James Baldwin says, nothing is more terrifying than to be divested of our crutch, our self-protection. So I'm asking you to open your kimono, be vulnerable, and see what happens. And do not, and I would underline this word, do not ask for any change from your partner in this discussion. Don't look for reciprocity. This discussion is only focused on what would make them excited about being with you? What kind of future would make them excited about being together? It's your turn will come later on, but not in this discussion. You start turning it around in this discussion. So here's what I want from you, honey. Guess what? That discussion is going to die. And then you're going to have even more cynicism, more despair, more loneliness. 
Right. So h- how do I handle my fear of um, this being like, I'm willing to do this and it's always on me. Like, and I don't want to, I keep hearing about people being codependent and changing for their partners. And now here I am, I'm asking my partner, like, what would life, what would things look like? Or how would I behave if we didn't have our fears and resentments? And I'm going to take that on. And like, I don't want to be the one, I don't want to be the only one working in this relationship, or I don't want to be the only one putting the effort in. Right. Well, that, I'll tell you what, I'll give you two answers. I can't tell you how to do it because you don't have the motivation to do it yet. And when you don't have the motivation, it will seem like too big of a risk, too much effort, so you won't do it. So right now, you don't have a strong enough motivation to take that approach. So anything I tell you about how to manage your fear is going to fall flat or you will yes, but it. So right off the bat, you don't have the motivation to have it. If you had the motivation, and if the marriage was important enough for you to have this kind of discussion, which believe me, you've never had this kind of discussion ever in this marriage. I'm telling you right now, you have never gone to your your partner and said, I wanna be a better team player, how can I do that? I guarantee you have never done that. How do I know that? Because 99% of couples never have that conversation with their spouse. So the odds are in my favor that you've never <laughs> done it. You want to create a great marriage? It ain't going to happen unless you're willing to take a, a risk, a clear risk. And it gets even worse. I'll give you the next step that makes it even worse for you. And then you're going to tell me you don't want to do it. And I'm going to say, that's okay. Don't do it then. But I'm going to give you one more step after you have that discussion that I just described. Mm -hmm. You know what my suggestion is going to be? You're going to take one or two things that he said he would like to see different in you. And then you're going to do it. You know why you're going to do it? So you can build up credibility and you have never asked him specifically what you can do. You go about scratching him where he doesn't itch or her, and then you complain you don't get the desired result. And so you don't speak his love language or her love language, and then you complain that you're not getting what you want. Well, guess what? You ask him what you can do to be a better team player, how you can improve what you're doing, either attitudinally or behaviorally, and he tells you, and you do it, now you start to have credibility to begin functioning as a team, where you get some credibility to suggest something you might want from him, but not until then. All right. And I could see the benefit here, too, of, um, you know, kind of like with the unmotivated partner, how you, you kind of put a time limit on it, you know, we're going to meet for some sessions and then you can still decide this isn't, it it seems like this would be another place where you would do that and say, you know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to give it 60 days or six months or whatever it's going to be. And yeah. yeah. See, when a couple comes in, I want us to be working collaboratively, collaboratively in the same direction. Instead of trying to convince somebody to give up their self-protective mechanisms that they cling to desperately in a relationship. I'm not going to pry that that new response out of them with a crowbar. They have to find a reason to make that do it. I will help them create a reason if I can, but I don't want to keep working with couples who are locked in a desperate grip on their self protections and they're not even open to the possibility of thinking about or talking about a better future. That is a prescription for, I'll put it this way. I used to be a statue of Liberty therapist. Send me your borderline, send me your passive aggressive, send me your narcissist, (laughs) send me your insurance people. And I will see anybody at any time. I'll even reduce their rate if they want my rate, if they want it, that's the statue of Liberty therapist. And I have spent too much time in my professional life being that way for couples. When somebody comes in the room and they say, who's the most motivated person to create a change in this room? I do not want my hand in the air. Gotcha. Yeah. See, and with the approach that we've been talking about, Neil, I am not reacting to their problems. I am trying to lead them in a different direction. If they don't want to go there, that's okay. 
It's the difference between leading and reacting. And just to give us a sense of like, you know, obviously we can't go all the way down this road, but what does it look like when a couple has spent a few sessions working while doing this homework? So the homework was appreciating each other and doing things for themselves that they feel proud of and then and then asking themselves this question about what would this what would this relationship look like what would these problems look like etc um if i didn't have my fears and resentments where do so where do they get here's 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 where we, see we start going in directions that most therapists don't go with couples mm-hmm I would say I would, after we've doing this for two or three weeks, whatever, I, I'm going to start the session by saying, I'm going to ask you guys two questions. What did you do differently since we last met based on what we covered in that meeting, our last meeting? What did you do differently based on what you learned or what we covered in our last meeting? And they go, what did we talk about? I don't remember. Maggie, do you remember what we talked about? It was good, but I don't remember. I say every week now, from now on, I'm gonna start the session by saying, what did you do differently? Because I want you to start connecting what we're doing here going forward and not forgetting it by the time you reach the third stoplight after you leave. So I'm gonna ask you two questions to start every meeting. What did you do differently based on what we covered or what you learned in our last meeting? That's one. And the second question I'm gonna ask you every time and you can say anything except, I don't know. I'm going to say, what did your partner do that you valued and appreciated since we last met? And did you tell them? Because I'm telling you, you guys will not, will never ever create a strong team if you don't start pointing out what they do that you care about. Otherwise, they don't know what, from anything about what you care about if you don't tell them. If they do something and they don't know you care about it, why should they continue? Right, right. And you'll never create a strong team. And if you guys, if your dominant energy is not to create a strong team, then I say, well, what's your theory about why we're meeting? (laughs) Right back to where we started. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I just want to note for you that um, Pete was on the show with Ellen Bader, his wife and colleague, talking about um, team building communication back in episode 204, um, which was actually, now that I look at it, it was almost, it was just slightly more than a year ago that we had that conversation. Um, There's also another conversation about getting unstuck and onto the same team back in episode 152. And then in episode 24, we talked a lot about lying because one of your earlier books was all about um, the the atmosphere and relationship that either fosters lies and the or fosters the truth. And, uh, and, right. how, and how both people co-create that dynamic. So that was episode 24. Um, Man, you are organized. <laughs> We've covered a lot of ground in our conversations, Pete. I appreciate that. You are that. organized. I'm impressed. <laughs> um, uh, is there anything like uh, we we've covered a lot of territory today as well, and I think this has been super helpful and uh, so funny for me to be that person because that is just so not me. Um, you know, aside from a little bit of existential cynicism that I've been feeling lately. Other than that, this is this that's not me. Um yeah, are there are there any important pieces that we left out of this equation? No, I think in in the various in and out of, you know, playing Jack, I think we covered the highlights. Yeah. Um about um I, I like the quote from Benjamin Disraeli who said, he talked about the difficult of being in a relationship. Mm -hmm. He says, said, it destroys one's nerves to be amiable to the same person every day. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it it can be a challenge for sure. It is. And it, it takes energy. It takes a lot of energy. 
hopefully more effort than work. Yes. Yeah, and 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 hopefully there's more you get more energy out than you're putting in. Yeah. Yeah. I also think it's important to emphasize too that one of the things you said early on, I don't want to gloss over the whole do something that you feel proud of piece. Um that that it it takes two strong individuals to yeah. actually make a strong team. And yeah. um, you know, listening to this, perhaps you're you're realizing that there's a lot of confrontation that doesn't happen in relationships that really ought to be happening. And one thing that I heard with you, Pete, is that you're you're laying things out for me as Jack and, and ultimately for Jill as well um, in a way that really forces us to confront what's real, like what's really yeah. happening and what's really happening for us. And, and even the possibility that we might we might not want to continue. We might not want to come back. Um, That's right. And being on the receiving end of that, I think it's powerful because it 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 wakes up in me the fact that I'm in choice about it. Oh, yeah. I get to actually choose what I want here. That's a good way of putting it, Neil. It wakes up the fact you have a choice. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. Great. Well, um, Pete, we started out as well by, I mentioned um, that there are some webinars coming up. If if people are listening to this very soon after it, it gets published, um, I, I don't know, is just Ellen doing the webinars? Are you participating uh, in that? Ellen is doing two by herself and I'm joining her with two. Okay. And these and are- it's a lot about confrontation mm -hmm. uh, for people who are entrenched in their, you know, patterns. Right. So, um, and these are free webinars, so, free, yes. and they're geared mostly towards therapists, right? Correct. Yeah. So if you're interested, um, again, I mentioned this at the top of the episode, neilsatin.com slash institute, as in the couples institute that, um, Pete and Ellen created. Um, if you go to that link, then you'll be able to sign up for those webinars, which are happening, um, October 2nd through October 5th of 2020. So um, you can always go to that link and see what's there because I've, I've used that link before. So um, neilsatin.com slash institute to check out what's happening with Pete and Ellen. Horrific. Um, and uh, in the meantime, Pete, thank you so much for uh, for being here with us again today to dive in with, uh, with Jack and Jill. <laughs> 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 to help them get up the hill and back down, hopefully safely again. Um, <laughs> well, Neil, uh, thank you for the invite again. I really appreciate being here, and I appreciate your willingness to be flexible and doing something different, you know, uh, for your audience, for you, for you and me. So thank you for your your flexibility and willingness to try something different. Yeah, you're welcome. That was fun. And one thing I want to mention about that, too, and – as I was really trying to embody Jack, one thing that I noticed was that with a lot of those questions that you were asking me, um, I had some pretty strong feelings coming up. Mm -hmm. And so it just reminded me that, and, and this could just be a story, but my story about this is that probably if someone is unmotivated and in Jack's shoes, that they do have a lot that's going on within them that will yeah. be woken up by this process. And thank you. And, um, and I think that's often part of what shuts those people down, right? Is that there's a lot happening in, for them. Totally. Um, yeah. Totally. And I'm imagining that if that came up in a session, like if I, as Jack, you know, you mentioned the coach thing, if I, you know, if I started crying about my father being that very person that you described, then the conversation might take a turn at that moment. It could, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So sometimes we look to the past to find answers. Yeah. Well, Pete, thank you again. Such a pleasure to have you here. And um, I definitely look forward to having you back at some point to take on something interesting and challenging. Uh, thank you, Neil. Good to be here again. Good seeing you again. Thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast 
and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word passion, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.